Welcome to the Slate Political Gap Fest. For Thursday, July 6th, this is the bonus Gab Fest Reads episode. I'm Emily Bazlan. I'm a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine and a fellow at Yale Law School. John and David are out this week, so we're going to do something a little different. We have a great extra Gab Fest Reads. I'm joined by Monica Potts, who is the author of The Forgotten Girls. Hey, Monica. Hey, Emily. Thanks for having me. Oh, so glad you're here. So I want to set the scene for your book a little bit. The setting for the book is your hometown of Clinton, Arkansas, population about 2,500 on the southern side of the Ozarks. And you write that almost everyone in Clinton goes to an evangelical church, and in the halls of the town's only high school, everyone knows everything about everyone else, or seems to. Who you dated, where you bought your clothes, how you acted on weekends, and even your destiny inherited from the generations that came before you. You grew up in Clinton. You left when you were 18 to go to college and have a career as a journalist. And then you moved back. Tell me about that. Why did you come back to Clinton? What were you thinking you might find there? So in 2012, there started to be a series of studies um, showing that life expectancy was declining for the least educated white Americans. Um, and that was especially true for the least educated white women. They were losing years of their lives. It's really uncommon for any demographic group to lose life expectancy expectancy. Normally, we are always increasing the amount of years that people live. Life gets better and better with medicine. Um, And we do that at different rates. But for a group to start falling behind is really unusual. And I had the sense as soon as I started reading those studies that this was really about the kind of place that I had left behind when I left college, that I felt like I knew the populations that were um, being left behind by medical progress that were backsliding and having worse lives than their the generation that came before them. And so I started to come back to Clinton to think about what I might find in regards to that, the kind of personal stories that might show why it was that life was getting worse for some of these um, women in particular. And I was back in 2015 and I was thinking about looking at this as a book project and I coincidentally heard from my childhood best friend Darcy who reached out to me on Facebook and said, I'm still here, you know, we should meet up. And I hadn't heard from her in years at that point. It had been, I had only seen her once since we graduated or since high school ended in 1998. And I met up with her. She told me kind of the broad outlines of her life and I told her why, why I was here and some of the statistics I had been seeing. And she said, well, maybe you should just write about me. And As soon as she said that, I started to think about what it might be like to tell that story of these statistics from the story of my hometown and the story of my personal relationship with Darcy and as a personal story instead of as a story about, you know, numbers and trends and instead of a traditionally journalistic story. How did your friendship with Darcy begin? How did you get to know her? I met her when I moved to Clinton and started public school in Clinton in the first grade. I was about six years old and she would have been five. She's a a tiny bit, a few months younger than me. I was in a different class than her, a different first grade class. And we met at recess. She just came up to me and wanted to get to know me and wanted to know where I was from and wanted to know everything about me. And that was unusual for me. I'm pretty shy. And she here was this outgoing girl who had really curly puffy hair at the time and a lot of freckles just like my sisters and I did and so we just became friends as far as I remember right away almost we started going to each other's houses on weekends she came over to my house a lot and played with me and my two younger sisters and we used to make potions and we used to have expeditions in our backyard which we thought was big at the time but I've seen it since and it's actually very small um we used to have an atlas that we looked at and imagined living far away from Clinton in a town that looked like the towns we saw on TV with sidewalks and neighborhoods and playing with kids our age. We read all of the books featured at our local school library and our local public library. We just were vor- voracious readers, really imaginative, creative kids. You tell a story that revolves a lot around middle school and how you both came of age. What starts to happen for you in Darcy in middle school and then in high school that makes your paths diverge? Yeah. So when we started middle school, we were both really good students. We were both people pleasers, adult pleasers. We wanted to be the best in the class. We were both those kinds of girls. And then 
Starting later in middle school when she was about 12 or 13, I was really surprised when I read my journals that I wrote as a kid. Later as an adult, I was surprised at how young it started for her. We were 12 when she was sneaking out to hang out with older boys. And she started sneaking out of her house, going to parties, hanging out with older teenagers. And I was not that way. I was too shy, I think. I also was really an adult pleaser and I wouldn't have wanted to get into trouble. And so I knew that my, I would have gotten in trouble with my parents. Um, and I think Darcy didn't have that feeling that she would get into trouble. And so she really started pushing boundaries. By the time we entered high school, she was experimenting more with drug use and alcohol use. She was dating much older boys and that became kind of the center of her life as partying boys and hanging out on weekends and school started to suffer. And at the time, were you envious? Like, did you feel like she was leaving you behind and she was more grown up and there was something exciting about what she was doing? Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to be more like Darcy. I tried to hang out with her. I think I just wasn't cool enough. (laughs) Darcy was the kid that everybody remembered being cool. And I really thought she had abandoned me, that my best friend was busy making friends with other people. And I kind kind of became lonely by the end of high school. And I think that helped make my decision to go far away to college easier. And when you think about the idea that she didn't fear getting into trouble at the time, That relates to different expectations that your parents had. You talk about your mother and how she was like really concerned um, about you and sending a message that you needed to be the kid who did well and that you didn't feel like Darcy was getting that same message from her mom. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, I my mom had left Clinton when she was younger in her 20s and lived in and around Chicago. She had always wanted us to leave as well. She disliked that she had returned to Clinton. She did not like life in Clinton. She didn't think it would provide opportunities for us. So the whole time we were growing up, it was that we had to leave. We had to do well in school. We had to use college as an opportunity to get ourselves out. And she ev- she read a lot. And she even introduced me to Bryn Mawr College, which is where I ended up going in kind of a roundabout way. She found the name of a college on a author book jacket that she thought she didn't know how to pronounce. And she was like, it's this women's college that starts with a B. And so I just went through all of them and eventually <laughs> found Bryn Mawr after a couple of missteps. And so I think that that was a huge motivator for me. And I kind of had the sense that I could do anything I wanted when I was 18 and out of Clinton, that then I would have the freedom that teenagers tend to crave and it would be worth that if I just waited a bit. Darcy didn't have that. We, we sort of never knew how much her parents knew about what she was doing on the weekends. But I do know that she just didn't get into trouble that much. Her mom told me that she always thought she would go to college, but it never seemed like it was her goal for her. She just kind of assumed it would happen. She assumed Darcy would do that. And she also talked about a lot about Darcy's choices as a teenager. And I thought later as an adult, that struck me as kind of weird that we think about 15 year olds making choices as opposed to being parented or directed. And so I think there were times I know that Darcy, I think would have preferred to have been caught and kind of stopped and kind of given stricter boundaries as a teenager. In some ways, you're telling a kind of classic story about the popular girl who's having sex with boys, who seems really enviable, but gets off of a kind of academic success track. You're telling it, though, in a place where it seems like it has especially toxic results for Darcy. And I wonder why you think that was true. What were the factors that made it really more dangerous for her to be skidding off without you in that direction? I think it's partly a resource question. I think it, I think kids do a lot of things that maybe in a more resourced community, their parents can kind of help them bounce back from a little bit better. So it's partly that we were really working class and we didn't have a lot of resources. And I do 
wonder if Darcy's substance use disorder had been developing by the time she graduated high school and she might have needed an intervention in that that probably wasn't available to her resource wise as far as far as the medical care available to us and her family. I think also the bigger problem, the bigger issue here is that it's a really small town with a lot of judgment. That's um, I write about the prevailing evangelical community. Um, there are a lot of people who think drinking is a sin. So even just kind of normal teenage behavior takes on kind of a darker element of sin and taking the wrong path and straying from God. And when that happens, you, you're kind of isolated. My mom and um, a lot of other parents who didn't approve of that kind of behavior, we weren't allowed to hang out with Darcy anymore because she thought that we would get just totally sidetracked and that there was no way back from that kind of path if you went on it when you were a teenager. So I think it was the isolation and judgment from the community that kind of at that point, it was easier. The Van Buren County where I live in Arkansas was a dry county. It was easier to get meth, I heard from Darcy and a lot of other people, than it was to get alcohol. So she started to go to parties where there all that was around and she started to hang out with people who did all kinds of, you know, experimented with all kinds of drugs, all kinds of alcohol, all kinds of partying. And I think that she lost touch with some of the friends who were doing something different, who spent their time in a different way. So it kind of isolated her. Hey, listeners, this was one hell of a Supreme Court term, and it's going to be a while before we can stop talking about it. So we're going to have a very special virtual event for Slate Plus listeners to keep the conversation going. Join me, Dahlia Lithwick, legal correspondent and host of Slate's Amicus podcast, and my indefatigable colleague, Mark Joseph Stern, on Friday, July 7th at 1230 p.m. Eastern Time, while we debrief on the ethics scandals, the justices, and the cases that shocked and surprised us the most. We're also going to answer your questions about the court and the decisions that came down this term. Slate Plus members will receive more information via email about how to join our Zoom event. And if you are not yet a Slate Plus member, join us. You will get access to Zoom events like this, ad-free listening, unlimited reading on Slate, and all bonus episodes and segments that come along with our podcasts. Head to slate.com slash plus to sign up today. See you next week. So you write at one point, the message at church was that we had to keep ourselves pure for our husbands. And the message at school was that sex would either kill us or leave us pregnant. And there was nothing we could do to prevent either scenario except abstain. I just wanted to ask you about that passage because it's a way of thinking about sex that's kind of similar to what you were just describing about alcohol and drugs, where it's like once you fall off into sin – there's no coming back. I wonder how much of an influence you think that had on Darcy and other girls you describe whose lives go on a kind of downward spiral as they grow up. I think it had a huge influence. There was this element of purity culture that pervaded even if your parents didn't go to those churches. In 1993, uh, True Love Wait started, which was this idea that you had to remain a virgin until you got married. And girls we went to school with started wearing promise rings. And people thought having sex before marriage was the worst thing you could do. Most of the sex education was abstinence only. And as late as 2017, our local paper, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, did a study Sex ed is up to local school districts, and they found that the schools that taught it, 85% of them were still using some variation of abstinence-only education. And so this idea that the only thing you can do to take control of your life is to never have sex is very similar to the, like, the only way you can do to remain on a godly path is never, ever to stray. And I think that that had an influence in the ways that we thought of our lives as these kind of um, pristine things that could never be broken or then you were always broken. And I think that that had a huge influence on how girls thought of their futures and how girls conceived of their possibilities. Because if you can't ever make mistakes, how do you learn and how do you grow? And if you can't ever like realize your full humanity, then what kind of an adult do you become? You just become a a wife to your future husband. What kinds of things happened to Darcy after high school? 
And I'm asking with a little hesitation because I think it's hard to write a book about someone who you're portraying as having a lot of difficulties, especially someone who you care about, who you have a close relationship with. And I don't want to suggest that this is all darkness because I think that would be unfair to her and to your portrayal of her. But I wonder, you know, what you're able to describe and then how you balance her trust in you in how you talk about her now as an adult. Mm. Yeah, I think by the time I met up with her, she felt like she'd had a really tough life. And so that's what we talked about a lot are the tough parts of it. But after I left for college, she did not go to college, really. She stayed in the Clinton area. She entered relationships with men that were often abusive. She had two kids pretty young. um, And eventually, she ended up in in prison for um, embezzlement. She had stolen um, money from the job she was working at at the time and ended up going to prison for that. And when I met up with her again in 2015, she was still on parole from that charge. So at that time, it wasn't, she was feeling better and she was feeling like her life was on an upper trajectory, but she was still struggling with substance use disorder. She was still struggling to put her life back together after having been in prison. And I think that the challenge of acknowledging the difficulty of that without it seeming like she never had any hope or any desires or any control over her life was really hard because she did also have those things. She was still the bright really friendly, really kind person that I had known when I was growing up. And I tried to, I could find that within her when we, when we started to talk again. And I'm also happy to say that since 2019, she's been sober and doing really, really well. And what's the publication of the book been like for her? She told me that she liked it. She told me some parts were hard to read, but they were hard to live. So that was not a surprise for her. And she's been really supportive. She did an interview with me and she went to an event with me. So she got to sign a couple of books in Little Rock, which was the best thing that I think could have happened. I thought a lot when I was reading your book about Hillbilly Elegy, which is a book by J.D. Vance, um, now a senator from Ohio, that's about Uh, You know, he comes from maybe a somewhat similar family of um, poor white people in West Virginia, another part of Appalachia. And his book is famous for turning some of the blame for opioid addiction in particular on the people he is writing about, the people in his family, as opposed to external factors like the lack of government support or the lack of jobs. I wonder what you make of that thesis and how you were thinking about these kind of structural policy factors versus individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really impossible to separate substance use disorder from something like the structural factors in a place like Clinton, you know, this, the the Clinton lost a lot of jobs and did the 2010s. There isn't a lot to do here. There's a lot of actual real pain. A lot of people who had jobs that were very physically intense when they were younger and they get older and they have a lot of problems with their body and they actually do need treatment for pain. So there was a lot of that around. There was a lot of prescriptions of opioids here. It was one of the interactions people had with doctors that if they were in pain or they reported pain, they could get opioids very easily. And I think also, I think about this a lot, but one of the things I saw with Darcy in my reporting was that she was in a lot of real pain. Thinking about also the the ways that drug ec- epidemics take root, they don't take root in places that are doing well, that have the support systems that people need, that have the safety nets that people need, that have the um, kinds of places where people can meet the challenges that they have in their life with assistance. They tend to take place in places that are abandoned and or um, going through economic hardship and spiraling downward. And then do you layer individual responsibility on top of that? I mean, when you're writing about Darcy's mother and you're wondering about her child rearing approach, there's a way in which like you are turning your lens onto her. And that seems like it, of course, it's part of the story, too. And I just wonder how you balance all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is part of the story because people do make choices within the realities that they're in. Um, and I guess the 
I guess the question I would want to ask is just, should it always be up to one person? Should it always be up to the mother? Should it always be up to the father? Should it always be up to the individual to always make the right choices? Or do we have places for people to kind of stumble and come back or kind of other sort systems that can help kids? Darcy always took responsibility. She always felt that it was her fault, everything that happened to her, that it was the result of her life and her choices. And I think that made her feel like she had agency over her life as well. So I think I thought that since she was willing to take choices, I didn't need to, that she had made choices that had led to some of the things in her life that I didn't necessarily need to do that for her. That was, she always considered that part of the equation. Yeah. One way I think about this is that poverty just means there's so much less of a cushion when you make mistakes. Like everybody makes mistakes. Everyone has things go wrong. And when you're in a situation of poverty, it's like there's this, you slam against the floor instead of hitting some cushioned or like net when you fall. Yeah, absolutely. And the cushion that is here stretched so thin across so many needs. And so, yeah, there. I think that that's exactly right. There was just nowhere to go, really. Slate Plus members, you get lots of extras with your Slate Plus subscription, like no hitting the paywall on the Slate site and bonus segments on shows like Slow Burn and Political Gab Fest. Our Slate Plus segment this week is a little different. John, David, and I taped an extra chatter segment where we talk about some stuff that's making us happy this summer and also a fantastic article about how bad things really are. And more. Go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. One of the things that you've been talking about and you write in the book is that when you got home, Clinton itself was declining and on the verge of dying. And you conclude that your mother was right to focus on getting you out, but you're back. Are you planning to stay? And how does that um, relate to the other work that you do? I'm not planning to stay. I, um, I'm i here with my partner, Samir, who very supportively came here when I wanted to come here. Um, and so it's his turn to pick where we go next. And I don't know where we're going to go. But I think that has more to do with us than it necessarily has to do with Clinton. We just kind of like to bounce around and, and trying to live in new places. But I will say that when I came back, I wanted to, I have deep roots in this community. I love this community. My mom was still here. I still have family here. And I think I felt I wanted to get out so much that I hadn't appreciated the better parts of Clinton when I was growing up, the parts of the culture that I like. The It's really incredibly beautiful. It's kind of an undiscovered little gem in the country. And I wanted to ha- kind of close the book on it and, and have closure with this place in a way that I needed to as an adult before I could move on and settle elsewhere. And what do you think the future is for towns like Clinton? What would you do to help them if you we're making the decisions? Um, Everyone has asked me that. And it's a really hard question. I will say that there's a couple more places open downtown since I wrote since I finished the book, there's a there's a store that went in. I think that my biggest hope is that the resources that are here are really sort of recognized and enhanced. I, we have a beautiful little old downtown. I would love if I could wave a magic wand to rejuvenate it and turn it into a kind of bustling little place that people could come visit on the weekends to see somebody make a fiddle or some kind of, you know, artisanal (laughs) or artisan like outlet here or like a little cafe and put in, I can just imagine what it would be like if I had been a teenager here and could walk from the school down to the downtown and gone to visit a bookstore and then had coffee with my friends and maybe taken music classes at the, in a downtown music school or something like that. So I think if I could wave a magic wand, I would turn the downtown into a vibrant little community and see what could come from that. Monica Potts is the author of The Forgotten Girls. Monica, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week's Slate Political Gab Fest. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of Gab Fest Reads. And we'll also be back next week with a regular episode of Slate Political Gab Fest. For Monica Potts, I'm Emily Baslon. David and John will be back with you next week. Hi, 
Seriously Plus, John and David are now with me by the miracle of time travel, and we're going to do a little bonus chatter for you for this holiday week episode. David, let's start with you. When you're drinking this weekend, what are you going to be chattering about? My chatter, uh, I'm thinking about um, a couple of things that in culture that are bringing me pleasure this summer. So I wanted to, to talk about two things bringing me pleasure that I hope will bring you, dear listeners, pleasure. First is the TV show Platonic, um, which is on Apple TV, which is starring Seth Rogen and Rose Byrne as platonic friends in their late 30s. Rose Byrne plays a uh, a mother of three who's who's trying to get back in the workforce. Seth Rogen plays a kind of man boy who had never has quite grown up, who who works in a in a um, brewery that he partly owns. And their dynamic, if you've ever seen the the movie Neighbors, where they played a married couple, their dynamic is awesome. They're incredibly good together and very 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 funny. And the show is very funny. It's and it's sort of wise about what it's like to get to middle age and grapple with what it means to to no longer be young. So I would recommend uh, Platonic on Apple TV. And then I want to recommend a book that I think Emily is the original source of the recommendation of, which is Horse by Geraldine Brooks. Emily, did you recommend it? I'm reading Horse, which is about the greatest racehorse of the American history or of the 19th century, which was a horse raised by an enslaved groom in Kentucky and Louisiana. And also so it's told back in the 1850s as this horse is, is growing up and then also told in uh, more or less the present. And it's wonderful. It is a wonderful, beautiful, engaging novel. And uh, Geraldine Brooks is a great writer and, and, and also just an easy writer to read. It's a very easy read. That was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation, go to slate.com slash Plus to become a member today. 